2,000 years, the history of ancient Egypt was buried in the sands of time. Travelers and scholars were aware of the existence of these enigmatic people, but nothing was known about them. What kind of men built these gigantic pyramids the size of mountains? To what gods did they dedicate their enormous temples the size of cities? And why did they preserve their dead, burying them with treasures beyond belief? Visitors to this ancient world would find strange picture writing everywhere. First called hieroglyphs by the Greeks, this mystical language fills the temples, monuments, and tombs. Walls abound with bizarre pictures of animals, human heads, and unknown shapes. Many surround paintings of Egyptians giving offerings to animal-headed gods. Even their dead were buried with this sacred script on their wrappings and coffins. What do these strange carvings say? Did the Egyptians possess potent medicines and powerful weapons? Would the words provide us with a direct link to the Bible? A key was needed to break the code, a key that would unlock the buried past. And the search for this elusive instrument would become one of history's great detective stories. By the time of Christ, the ancient Egyptians were already legends of a distant past. Greek and Roman historians could only guess at what knowledge this once powerful civilization possessed. As the centuries passed and Europe emerged from the Dark Ages, ancient Egypt remained silent, waiting for its own rebirth. It took one of the most powerful men of all time to awaken Egypt from its sleep a man whose leadership in battle was matched only by his passion for history. During the late 1700s, the French and British were fighting a war for world domination. In 1798, General Napoleon Bonaparte proposed leading the French army on a military invasion of Egypt. If the French could command this crossroads between Europe and Asia, it would control trade and become the most powerful country in the world. By this time, the 29-year-old Napoleon had become a legend in the French army. His victories over Austrian forces in Italy established France and himself as new powers to be reckoned with. Napoleon's sense of history and destiny led him to view Egypt as his next prize. On July 1st, 1798, Napoleon's army sailed into Egypt's port city of Alexandria. In addition to 38,000 soldiers, 167 of France's top scientists and scholars were on board. Rarely have military expeditions had academic interests as well. Napoleon was fascinated with ancient Egypt. Perhaps like Alexander the Great, Napoleon believed his destiny was to annex Egypt on his way towards conquering the world. The egocentric Napoleon viewed Egypt as more than just the cornerstone of an empire. He knew of its legends, its power, and its history. This was the land of the pharaohs, kings who were considered gods by their subjects. They ruled over the world's greatest civilization for over 2,000 years. Napoleon was determined to learn their secrets. Like Julius Caesar before him, Napoleon wanted to win the hearts and minds of the Egyptians. As a member of the French Institute of Egyptology, Napoleon personally selected the academics who formed his expeditionary force. While the French army swept up the Nile, crushing all opposition, the scholars immediately began their work, setting up an institute in Cairo. This became the headquarters for Napoleon's academic expedition. They scattered across Egypt, exploring tombs, climbing monuments, studying, sketching, and recording everything in sight. The wealth of information was unbelievable. Napoleon demanded to be constantly informed. If any clues to ancient secrets were uncovered, he wanted to know immediately. 
While Napoleon's men were busy annexing both Egypt's land and antiquities, England did not stand idly by. Within weeks, the British Navy attacked the French, destroying their ships and trapping Napoleon's army in a two-year-long siege. Napoleon himself eventually snuck past the blockade and returned to France. His hopes for ruling the world dashed. As the abandoned French army fought to stay alive, scientists and scholars were giving birth to modern Egyptology. Racing against their inevitable removal by the British, they stepped up their efforts to copy and analyze as much as possible, hoping to find the answers to the many puzzles surrounding them. Ironically, it was neither a scientist nor a scholar, but a soldier who made the most important discovery of all. In mid-July 1799, as the long siege wore on, the French continued to bolster their defenses. Situated along the Nile as it enters the Mediterranean Sea is a town called Rosetta. In order to rebuild the town's old Arabic fort, men under the command of Lieutenant Pierre Bouchard started to reconstruct the walls. Arabs commonly took material from ancient temples and used them in their own buildings. Unnoticed in these walls, buried since the time of the pharaohs, was a large stone tablet. When the soldiers tore down the fort's walls, they stumbled upon the tablet. Immediately, the soldiers noticed something strange and potentially valuable. Carved on this dusty stone were three types of writing, Greek, a common Egyptian script called demotic, and hieroglyphs. The stone was a kind of magical discovery. And I think it is a piece of extraordinary luck that whoever was there had the perspicacity and the interest to say, gosh, you know, what have we got here? Um, could be important, key <laughs> um, to the hieroglyphs. One can imagine that a less well-informed um, officer might have said, oh, you know, it's just an old stone, build it into the fort. Um, People have often said, you know, thank God it was a French officer, not a British officer, because, you know, they were perhaps a little more intellectually minded. Dubbed the Rosetta Stone, it measured three feet nine inches high and two feet four inches wide. It weighed nearly 1,500 pounds. French General Jacques Minieu ordered it sent to the Institute in Cairo to have the Greek translated. What did it say? Could the Greek be used to translate the hieroglyphs? The discovery caused an immediate sensation. Because the Greek language was understood, scholars quickly translated the text. It was a decree honoring the Greek pharaoh Ptolemy V on his first year of rule. In exchange for services rendered by him benefiting Egypt, plaques were to be placed in temples throughout the land. It was known that Greeks had ruled Egypt from 300 BC until the decades before Christ. The tablet had survived for over 1,800 years. Did others exist? The actual wording seemed unimportant until the last line was read. This decree shall be inscribed on the sela of hard stone in sacred and native and Greek characters. That meant all three scripts said the same thing. The news spread quickly back to Europe. This stone offers great interest for the study of hieroglyphic characters. Perhaps it would even give us the key at last. Courrier de l'Egypte, August 1799. The Rosetta Stone would not stay in French hands for long. The British siege would soon force them to surrender it. Napoleon's two-year military campaign in Egypt was a complete disaster. Over 9,000 men were killed, and the French Navy was decimated by the British. Those who remained were now trapped in Egypt, isolated by a British naval siege along the Mediterranean coast. But the scientific and cultural aspects of the French expedition were a tremendous success. 
This voyage gave birth to modern archaeology, man's search for his own past. And with the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, it seemed as if Egypt's great secrets would finally be revealed. A civilization which had remained silent for so long now seemed poised to speak. Both French and English military men kept a close watch on the deciphering of the hieroglyphs. French officers in Egypt knew firsthand the power and glory of the ancient Egyptians. The indisputable evidence was before their eyes. The pyramids and temples were obviously built by a great and advanced civilization. If the Rosetta Stone could be used to translate its language, some of Egypt's former glory might be resurrected and become that of France. How quickly could the French decipher the stone and thus read the hieroglyphs? Would the code be cracked before the British forced their surrender? Under military orders, scholars at the Institute raced to complete the deciphering. The stone had three texts written on it, each in a different script. Reading top to bottom, they were hieroglyphs, demotic, and Greek. The Greek section told of the tablet having the same information written in all three languages. While Greek was easily understood, using it to translate the two Egyptian scripts presented several obstacles. First and foremost, nobody had been able to speak or read either Egyptian language for almost 2,000 years. The French had no idea as to what any of the Egyptian symbols or words meant. Were the signs phonetic like an alphabet, or were they pictorial like Chinese character writing? Without any clues, they had to start from scratch. A second hurdle was that the stone was broken at the top and sides. The hieroglyphic section at the top was the most damaged. Only 14 lines of text existed. The demotic section in the middle had all of its 32 lines of text, but was broken along the right side. The Greek section consisted of 54 lines. The frustrated French had no way of knowing which words or lines of text matched up with which Greek words. Time was not on their side. In August 1801, two years after the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, the English ended their siege, attacking and forcing the French to surrender Egypt. French military officers were allowed to keep their personal possessions, but the Institute in Cairo had to hand over all of their discoveries. The academics were furious. What right did the British military officers have to abscond with the legacy of the past? Egypt belonged to mankind. What would become of these priceless treasures? When the British got the French to surrender at Alexandria, the Rosetta Stone was already famous, although I think it was more famous in France than it was in Britain, but it was certainly regarded as one of the spoils of war, and it was regarded as one of the, the fruits of the British victory. The French were distinctly reluctant to let the stone out of their hands and hid it away, trying to pretend they hadn't got it. You are taking from us our collections, our drawings, our copies of hieroglyphs. But who will give you the key to all that? Without us, this material is a dead language that neither you nor your scientists can understand. Sooner than permit this vandalic spoliation, we will destroy our property. We will scatter it amid the sands and throw it into the sea. If it is celebrity you are aiming for very well, you can count on the long memory of history. You too will have burnt a library in Alexandria. Member of the French Institute in Cairo, 1801. General Jacques Mignou, now in command after Napoleon's flight back to France, attempted to keep the Rosetta Stone in French hands. After failing in an attempt to smuggle the stone out of Egypt by ship, Mignou had it wrapped in cloth and hidden among his private possessions. If confronted, Mignou would claim it was his personal property and thus exempt from forfeiture. Knowing the French would try to slip the Rosetta Stone out of the country, the British military brought in William Hamilton from Greece. He had an eye for the antiquities of the world. While in Greece, he was instrumental in acquiring ancient artifacts from the Parthenon in Athens. The British knew he would not leave Egypt without more treasures for the king. 
Hamilton and the British military suspected Minou of hiding the stone. When confronted at his home in Alexandria, Minou protested vigorously his right to keep the stone, but the British officers were insistent. At the point of a gun, Minou agreed that the French were on the losing end of this battle. Minou agreed that the British had won the right to this most valuable of trophies. William Hamilton confirmed that the stone was authentic and the British Army finally took possession of their prize. The Rosetta Stone was immediately shipped back to England, arriving in February 1802. England now had the key, but the French had made copies. Now the feverish race began. Who would be the first to decipher its cryptic message? At the beginning of the 1800s, reports from newly explored parts of the world amazed the European and American public. No discovery was too incredible. Anything seemed possible. As news of Egypt's wealth of wonders began to circulate, the fascination for all things Egyptian became insatiable. There was a feeling that the hieroglyphs contained secrets about the gods, the universe, uh, astronomy, uh, that were simply not known to ordinary people. There was curiosity right from the start because the things are so obvious and so pictorial and above all because they've been associated with the temples, the priesthood. There was a feeling that they had to contain mysteries, that hieroglyphs weren't just ordinary writing, that there you had a civilization that if only you could crack the mystery would tell us things that nobody had ever thought of. With the key to the Egyptian language in hand, all eyes turned toward the decoding of the Rosetta Stone. After it arrived in London in 1802, copies of the stone's text began to spread to universities throughout Europe. The race to decipher the stone was beginning to develop into one of the world's great international competitions. Perhaps its answers would change fundamental views on religion, science, and history, and maybe shed new light on the Bible itself. What marvelous medicines and technology were going to be discovered? How and why did such an advanced civilization perish? As language specialists began to study the relationship between the three scripts, no clear pattern was evident. The broken stone seemed to block any effort to match words and sentences. Not one hieroglyphic word or phrase could be positively identified. How was this seemingly impossible task going to be accomplished? Desperate for any clues, Scholars dug into the past for help. The earliest account of the Egyptian language is a Greek book written by Hora Apollo. Said to be an Egyptian priest, he wrote extensively on the usage and meaning of hieroglyphs. His 5th century BC book, Hieroglyphica, became the cornerstone of future research. Hora Apollo wrote of 189 different hieroglyphic signs. For each one, he detailed its description and mythological meaning. While he discussed the specifics of individual signs, Hor Apollo never combined them to form sentences or paragraphs. Hor Apollo tells us things that actually are true, but he tells us uh, things for quite the wrong reason. So he says, for example, that in Egyptian hieroglyphs, the word for mother is written with a vulture. That happens to be true. But he then explains that in nature there are no male vultures. All vultures are female. And there's a great mystery here. Now, later on, as people started to look at the natural world and spotted indeed that there were vultures that were male and female, poor old Horopolo got discredited. So the truth he was telling us got thrown out with the mystical verbiage that he dressed it in. Scholars attempting to decipher the Rosetta Stone also consulted historians' findings from the past. During the Renaissance, religious writers had supported the idea that the hieroglyphs held answers to biblical riddles. People start to interpret ancient Egypt entirely through the Bible. So they look at the pyramids and say, hmm, um, the pyramids are not just ordinary tombs for ordinary kings. They are the granaries that Joseph, in the Bible, put up to collect the grain during the seven good years. 
in preparation for the seven years of famine that were going to follow. So the mystery is kept, but it's always filtered through the idea that it reflects a story in the Bible. Scholars also reviewed the work of German mathematics professor Athanasius Kircher. He became the recognized authority on hieroglyphs during the mid-1600s. Like Hor Apollo before him, Kircher described each hieroglyph as representing an idea or a concept. Unlike Hor Apollo, Kircher began to combine them into words and phrases, and then went further, simply making up imaginary translations. His fanciful readings led even the Pope to believe he could actually read the Egyptian language. Over a century later, at the time of Napoleon's expeditions, Kircher's studies were still widely held as true. What the first scholars attempting to decipher the Rosetta Stone found in past accounts was the commonly held belief that hieroglyphs were pictorial, similar to oriental character writing. Each hieroglyph represented a word or idea. It wasn't until these old theories were abandoned that the Rosetta Stone would finally reveal its clues. In 1802, Sylvester de Saussy of France and Johann Ackerblad of Sweden were the first to throw out the ideas of the past and try a fresh approach. They looked at Egyptian hieroglyphs and said, other civilizations write in perfectly normal ways. Um, I don't see why the Egyptians have to be different. They looked also at other documents from Egypt, not simply temples and obelisks and hieroglyphs, but things on papyrus, paper documents. And they said rightly, look, the Egyptians had perfectly good ways of writing perfectly ordinary everyday letters. Maybe all of their writing system is rational after all. De Saussy and Ackerblad followed the premise that the Demotic language used the Western system of writing. They took a number of recurring Greek words, including the pronouns he or his and the word Greek. They then searched the Demotic text for words which were repeated in roughly the same location. They verified that wherever these words occurred in Greek, they appeared in a similar pattern in the Demotic. What these pioneers did was to begin to prove that the script was not just a symbolic script, that there were signs that meant individual letters, stood for individual letters. You no longer looked at it as something esoteric and full of hidden meaning. Although their first step at translating the Demotic text was somewhat promising, de Saussy and Ackerblad gave up, having failed to crack the hieroglyphic code. Three years after the Rosetta Stone's discovery, opening the window onto Egypt's secrets was proving to be far more complex than anyone had thought. The greatest minds of Europe were beginning to think the secrets of Egypt would stay hidden forever. More than a decade passed following de Saussy and Ackerblad's attempt without any further serious efforts. Although the public's fascination with ancient Egypt continued to grow, the Rosetta Stone was all but forgotten. To those dreaming of trying to decipher the hieroglyphs, the failure of de Saussy and Ackerblad proved an intimidating legacy. There was a, a feeling, as with most decipherments, that it's a big prize, but also a big risk. You could end up covering yourself with glory, and you could end up making a really big fool of yourself. Now, scholars are, by temperament, rather cautious. And it takes a certain kind of person to say, I don't care if I make a fool of myself, I'm going to have a go at this. Although more tombs and temples filled with hieroglyphs were being discovered, no one seemed capable of reading their secrets. As the 15th anniversary of the discovery of the Rosetta Stone came and went, no further progress had been made on deciphering it. Although past failures seemed to deter any serious future efforts, two men would soon step forward, each claiming he was the first to turn the key. In the summer of 1814, a 41-year-old physician, physicist, and linguist from London took a copy of the Rosetta Stone to his country home. He decided to spend his summer vacation mulling over its puzzle. This time, 
the Rosetta Stone would begin to speak. Thomas Young was one of the most remarkable people that Britain has ever produced. If you do a list of his achievements, it is quite amazing. He looked at the question of light and how that works, and he comes up with the wave theory of light, which is the foundation of a lot of modern physics. He is interested in the human eye. He's interested in how it sees color. He's interested in perception. And his notions of the human eye are at the basis of a lot of modern optics. This man was probably the most brilliant problem solver that Britain has ever produced. Young felt much of the mysticism surrounding ancient Egypt was nonsense. He did not believe secrets to the universe were going to be discovered. What attracted him to the Rosetta Stone was that it was a problem, an unsolved puzzle, and he wanted a chance to crack it. Young began by concentrating on the words graphically. He located lines in the Greek text which had words occurring more than once. He then attempted to find lines in the Demotic text which had groups of symbols repeated these same numbers of times. Using this matching system, Young was systematically able to identify 86 Demotic translations, including the words King, Ptolemy, and Egypt. Where de Saussi and Ackerblad had stopped, Young's initial success led him to continue his efforts. Egyptologists had long been fascinated by the hieroglyphs that were surrounded by ovals. Called cartouches, they seemed to be placed strategically in and around temples and tombs. A few Egyptologists have begun to speculate that a cartouche represented the name of a pharaoh or member of the royal family. Young used this knowledge to work on the theory that the cartouches on the Rosetta Stone would contain the name Ptolemy. Since the tablet was written in his honor, his name should be on the cartouches in the hieroglyphic section. Young further surmised that because Ptolemy was a Greek name, the Egyptians would have to write his name phonetically. If the hieroglyphs were pictorial, they would not contain symbols for foreign names or words. Four years after he began, Young correctly matched the Greek letters in the name Ptolemy with the hieroglyphs inside one of the cartouches. In 1818, he became the first to bring the stone to life. The hieroglyphic section had spoken its first word, Ptolemy. While his success was beginning to gain the public's attention, across the English Channel in France, another man had already been obsessed with deciphering the Rosetta Stone, a man Young would initially encourage and then later regret having helped at all. Thomas Young's work was well known, uh, not only in England, but also in other countries. What's more, he sent copies of his work to various scholars up and down the continent and particularly to Paris. And copies of Young's work were sent to Sylvestre de Sassy. One day, de Sassy showed a copy of Young's work to a young Frenchman. And the name of the Frenchman was Jean-Francois Champollion. The destiny of young Jean-Francois Champollion seemed tied to the Rosetta Stone from birth. French legend describes how his bedridden mother was visited by a sorcerer months before Jean-Francois was born. Looking into the eyes of this sickly woman, the sorcerer saw the past being connected with the future. He predicted this woman's unborn son would be the one to bring light onto the centuries of the past. Champollion was born in Fijac, France in 1790 to a small town bookseller. When he was 11 and living at a boarding school in Grenoble, news of Napoleon's expedition to Egypt captured the imagination of France. Champollion's older brother, Jacques Joseph, read tales of Egypt's glories and mysteries to his younger brother. When the younger Champollion received a copy of the Rosetta Stone from a cousin who had traveled to Egypt as part of the expedition, he was hooked. Young Jean-Francois made it his goal to read the hieroglyphs. And that, of course, meant cracking the Rosetta Stone. All his early training was undertaken with that in mind. Languages became his all-consuming obsession, and he soon paid little attention to his other studies. 
His efforts became focused on Oriental and Middle Eastern languages, especially Coptic. Coptic had been a language spoken by Christians in Egypt and written in Greek. When he was about 14, Champollion uh, was working far too hard, uh, not on his schoolwork, but on Egyptian hieroglyphics. And he had what nowadays I think would be called a, a minor nervous breakdown. And he was sent off to recover. And he wrote a letter back to his elder brother saying, it's so boring here, send me a Chinese grammar. That was the kind of obsessive personality that Champollion was. Champollion's early studies focused on the deciphering of the Demotic language and its relation to Coptic. He had previously believed that hieroglyphs were symbolic, that they were mysterious and could not be deciphered in an ordinary way. Champollion began to sense the same links between the Greek names and the hieroglyphic cartouches. When reports of Thomas Young's work reached him, Champollion realized in a flash they were correct. Champollion would take Young's work and propel it forward. After obtaining an inscription of a known cartouche of Cleopatra from the Temple of Philae, Champollion recognized that if Ptolemy and Cleopatra have common letters, their hieroglyphs should have similar signs as well. When Champollion compared their hieroglyphic names, the signs for P, L, and O lined up. Champollion had proved Young's theory that foreign names were spelled phonetically in the hieroglyphic language. The door was now opened and Champollion was about to walk through. Champollion realized that Young was right, that you could show that hieroglyphs could write the names of the Greek rulers of Egypt. But that was one thing. It may be that that was simply a way used in later times to write foreign names. The question was whether hieroglyphs went back in the same way into earlier periods. Champollion took a look at a copy of an inscription from the great temple of Karnak. This inscription had a king's name repeating itself many times. The king's name was written with three signs. At the top was a sun disk. Champollion knew from Coptic that the name of the sun in ancient Egyptian was pronounced Ra. At the bottom was a letter that Thomas Young had identified, the letter S. It was written twice. What he now had was a name of a king that began with Ra and ended with S. The middle sign was a tricky one. It had not been deciphered by Young or anyone else. But Champollion traced that sign in the Rosetta Stone. It occurred several times. Whenever it occurred, the Greek translated into the idea of birth or being born. Champollion knew the Coptic for to give birth was Misa, and suddenly he had a king's name, beginning with Ra, continuing with Misa, and ending in S. And Champollion knew the ancient names of the kings of Egypt, and he knew that there had been a famous king on the throne of Egypt called Ra Messias. And suddenly, he realized he was looking at the key to the whole thing. The knowledge of Coptic, the alphabet deciphered by Thomas Young, plus his immense knowledge of ancient Egypt, gave one the decisive breakthrough. And at this point, he comes up with, Je tiens l'affaire, I've got it. Young's reaction to Champollion's efforts were mixed. He was happy to see someone moving their work forward, but he was enraged by Champollion's refusal to give him any credit. Champollion may have had the same ideas, but his work was not published. Young's was. When Champollion finally did publish his results, he became the talk of Paris. All of France celebrated the fact that a Frenchman had deciphered the hieroglyphs first. But Champollion wouldn't be sidetracked by fame and glory. He turned back to his efforts in a deepening obsession to decode the past. He was now determined to compile a complete list of all pharaohs and the dates they held power. By 1824, Champollion had built a hieroglyphic alphabet containing 21 letters. The door to Egypt's past was finally opening. 
the Rosetta Stone was proving to be the key that would finally unlock the hieroglyphs. But what secrets would they reveal? Announcement of Jean-Francois Champollion's discovery brought him much acclaim in France. The French Academy had previously considered him a crazy obsessive, working away in his room and getting nowhere. But now, suddenly, he was a national hero. The French government asked Champollion to arrange the purchase of Egyptian antiquities already in the hands of British collectors. After its incorporation into the Louvre Museum in 1827, Champollion was appointed the museum's first curator of Egyptian antiquities. However, Champollion had more on his mind than building a museum's inventory. He wanted to travel to Egypt. In 1828, with help from the Museum of Turin in Italy, Champollion organized an expedition to travel up the Nile River. This was the largest scientific study of Egypt since Napoleon's. It was his first exposure, and an absolute stunning exposure, to the monuments of Egypt. And of course, he ran around them like a wild thing, identifying cartouches. This is what was one thing that was obsessing them at the time, trying to establish the dates of monuments and the order of kings, because they had no true framework for Egyptian history that they could base on the evidence from the monuments. Champollion's trip proved beyond a doubt his methods were accurate. He was able to read the ancient Egyptian language off the temple walls themselves. His efforts in translating the hieroglyphs are credited with single-handedly creating the science of Egyptology. Egypt was no longer the land of silence. It now spoke directly from the past. The names of pharaohs such as Ramses and Tutmos were legendary. Now their faces could be identified. We now knew when they ruled and in which temples they prayed. Upon returning to Paris, Champollion continued his work. He now had enough material to write the definitive history of Egypt. Unfortunately, he would never get the chance. On March 4, 1832, Jean-Francois Champollion died. Champollion never had any doubts about his own ability and about his own achievement. And although he died at the age of 42, Towards the end of his life, it was realized what he had done. And the French, quite rightly, created a professorship of Egyptology for him, the first anywhere in the world. So he died knowing that his achievement had been recognized. A lot of Champollion's work was left after his death, and the elder brother collected it, published it as a memorial to the genius in the family. Where Champollion had focused on the pharaonic history of Egypt, others began to use his tools to study the demotic and hieroglyphic languages. The amount of written material on walls and on papyrus scrolls was tremendous. As the years went by, the social, political, and economic history of the ancient Egyptians began to reveal itself. But it was the personal written record that surprised most people. We learned that by looking at the ancient Egyptians, we are looking at ourselves. Slowly, it became clear that the Egyptians were like the rest of us. Uh, they wrote letters to the bank manager. They wrote um, letters to the local tax official. They wrote letters to each other um, about various normal aspects of normal lives. They had literature, just like ours, not very different. The Rosetta Stone brought the history of ancient Egypt to life. Although the Rosetta Stone has been deciphered now for more than 170 years, the treasures it has enabled us to understand continue to surface. From the spectacular find in the tomb of Tutankhamun in 1922, to the uncovering of the tomb of the sons of Ramses the Great in 1995, Ancient Egypt is still providing new and amazing discoveries. The Rosetta Stone is a milestone between a period when all we knew about our own origins was in the Bible or in the writings of the Greeks and the Romans. 
After the Rosetta Stone, we start to look at ancient history speaking for itself. It starts to say, where have we come from? Where have the ideas come from? What are our roots? And the Rosetta Stone is a way of bringing us face to face with our own identity. Today, the ancients speak again, thanks to men like Napoleon, Thomas Young, and Jean-Francois Champollion. Hunters who brought the past to life only because they dared to go in search of history.